And good evening. Tonight, California, under a state of emergency, one of the most dangerous storms in years, expected to trigger mass power outages, mudslides, and treacherous flat fl flash flooding. The powerful bomb cyclone already dropping heavy snow in the Sierra Nevadas. And this is just the beginning. Back to back to back bands of rain known as atmospheric rivers barreling towards the coast expected to drop up to 20 inches of rain. The ground already dangerously saturated from flooding earlier this week. You'll remember these images of cars flooded up to their roofs, drivers stranded. That system spawning 17 reported tornadoes as it tore across the country. A new video showing the moment an EF1 tornado ripped through a high school in central Arkansas. Look at this. Students sheltering inside at the time, but luckily and incredibly, no injuries reported. Roads buckling from the flooding in Georgia, a massive sinkhole swallowing an entire car in athens Clark County. You can see it there. And North Carolina battered with severe thunderstorms. Video showing the moment a lightning strike sent sparks flying in Mooresville. And officials warn the new round of storms could do far greater damage. NBC News national correspondent Miguel Almaguer is live in San Francisco tonight for us. He's going to lead our coverage on this story. Miguel, we said it earlier, this area has already uh, taken so, so much of a hit of weather and that ground is so saturated, things are just starting to get bad where you are. That's right, Tom. We're still in between bands on the front end of the storm. We finally have a bit of a lull, but it was raining all day earlier today. Forecasters are describing this storm as, quote, brutal and life-threatening. As you mentioned earlier this week, California just got crushed with a massive storm. Now even a few inches of rain could be catastrophic. Now in a state of emergency, this is exactly what California is bracing for. The front of a new winter storm forecasted to be potentially more powerful than the system that triggered daring rescues, widespread flooding, and washed out roads. We need the rain, but we don't need it all at once. After spending days underwater, 33 million are under flood watches tonight. Bay Area cities on high alert. This is an extreme uh weather event and we're moving from extreme drought to extreme flood. With up to eight inches of rain possible across California and four feet of snow with 100 mile an hour winds in the mountains, a bomb cyclone connected to a strong atmospheric river will wallop the west. Over the next seven days, three separate atmospheric rivers could drop up to 20 inches of rain. A storm system powerful enough to strand drivers, trigger landslides, and swallow roads again. It was like a full river. You couldn't stand where you're standing right now. It would take you down. Bracing for an onslaught of wicked weather, the storm system that did this damage fueled 17 reported tornadoes in states like Arkansas and Alabama. Today, the south still swamped parts of Kentucky underwater, roads and cars disappearing in Georgia. Back in California, the cleanup from the first storm is still underway, just as the next one barrels down and promises to deliver a devastating blow. All right, Miguel, back with us live. And Miguel, this, this storm has already turned deadly for a 19-year-old in the Bay Area. That's right, Tom. The roads out here are incredibly dangerous. The California Highway Patrol investigators looking into that crash believe she likely hydroplaned on water, then slammed into a pole. That's a major concern. It's why city officials are asking people to please stay off of the road, to stay at home when they can. The conditions are so dangerous. It is so wet outside, Tom. And Miguel, on that point, what have the warnings been like in that area from officials? Well, officials are asking people who can to stay at home, especially over the next 24 hours. We're really expecting the brunt of this storm to roll in overnight as many people are home. They're worried that folks who try to make their way out to work tomorrow are going to be trapped in those submerged roads. They may not see them at the early morning hours as it remains dark here in San Francisco until about 7, 730 in the morning. That's a big concern, the morning commute. They're asking people to stay off the roads and to stay home if they can, Tom. Yeah, those winter hours make it so much more difficult. Okay, Miguel, you and your team, please stay safe. We want to get more now on the forecast. NBC News meteorologist Bill Karens joins us now in studio. So, Bill, talk to us about the latest track on this atmosphere. Yeah, Miguel, in about one hour from now, is going to be in the highest winds and the most extreme rainfall rates. So it's a big heads up to his crew. Now, this storm, anytime you see a storm on a map like this that looks like a cinnamon bun, that's when you know it's a really intense storm. That's why we call this a bomb cyclone because it intensified so fast. And that atmospheric river is now approaching California, and with it will be the 
highest winds and the highest rainfall rates. Look at the bright yellows on the radar right there. That's where we could see, you know, two, three inches of rain in a very short period of time. What makes this storm unusual is going to be the high winds. It's going to, it's rained heavily before. It rained heavy last weekend. It's going to rain heavy again tonight. But these winds, 50 to 60 miles per hour, even in San Francisco and Sacramento, the mountains could gust 80 to 100 miles per hour. So we're probably going to wake up with hundreds of thousands of people without power, maybe even potentially millions of people if the winds are high enough. The flash flooding threat and the flood threat goes in Northern California all the way down through areas of Los Angeles. And this will be through the overnight hours and then tomorrow morning down towards Santa Barbara in LA. The highest rainfall rates will be in the next couple hours as this moves inland up to eight inches possible north of Napa. And how about the snowfall, Tom? This is rare. We have our indicators here, two, three, four feet. Usually I tell you snow in inches. This will be measured in feet. Hey, Bill, before before you go, I do want to ask you, how much time are people there in California going to have in between all these storms? Yeah, we were thinking we know we need the crews to get the power back on. So as we take a look at the weekend forecast, we're OK on Friday. But on Saturday, another atmospheric river is going to come on shore. This one looks to be pinpointing more this northern half of California. But again, high winds, more rainfall and the potential for more flooding. All right, Bill Karen's on those atmospheric rivers that we're learning about more and more every day. All right, Bill, thank you for that. Now to the showdown on Capitol Hill and the absolute mess that has been made in the vote for Speaker of the House. With Republicans newly in control, Kevin McCarthy failing vote after vote again today as 20 of his fellow party members stand defiant. All usual business of the House on hold until a speaker is voted in. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ryan Nobles has the latest from the Hill. Tonight, no surrender in that simmering standoff over the speaker's job, with that small group of right-wing Republicans still blocking GOP leader Kevin McCarthy from the votes he needs. We'll go through, and we'll keep talking, we'll go we'll find and get to an agreement. McCarthy seen negotiating throughout the day. He has a little more than 200 Republican supporters, but he needs 218 and shows little sign of winning over the 20 Republicans who want someone else. Those holdouts ignoring pleas from former President Trump overnight to support McCarthy. Mr. Trump arguing the chaos was overshadowing Republicans' victory in the House, writing, quote, Republicans do not turn a great triumph into a giant and embarrassing defeat. A request that Mr. Trump's most passionate supporters turned back against McCarthy. I think it actually needs to be reversed. The president needs to tell Kevin McCarthy that, sir, you do not have the votes and it's time to withdraw. McCarthy's already made major concessions to the Republican rebels. The divide appears increasingly personal against McCarthy. This country needs leadership that does not reflect this city, this town that is badly broken. But critics dub the holdouts the Taliban 20. And patience is starting to wear thin among rank-and-file Republicans who want this speaker's fight to come to an end. Troy Nels is a member of the Conservative Freedom Caucus, like many of the holdouts, but he is supporting McCarthy. What's going to change? They've made it very, very clear they really don't trust McCarthy. Uh, I understand it, and what we're going to go through today, if we continue down this path, I think it hurts the Republican Party. The 20 holdouts picked Florida's Byron Donalds as their nominee. At this point, do you believe it's time for Kevin McCarthy to step aside? Uh, I don't think we're there at this point. Are you worried about retribution? Man, I'm 6'2", 275. I'm not worried about that. We'll work through it and figure it out. All as President Biden slammed the chaos while appearing in Kentucky with top Senate Republican Mitch McConnell. To be able to have a Congress that can't function is just embarrassing. All right, Ryan Nobles joins us now from Capitol Hill. Ryan, I'm sure you're getting asked this question by everyone, especially probably friends and family. What, what, what's going to happen here? Do you actually see a scenario where Kevin McCarthy steps aside? It's definitely possible, Tom, especially as we continue on and vote after vote shows him not making any progress with this faction of Republicans that aren't interested in making him the next Speaker of the House. There's negotiations ongoing as we speak right below me in the office of one of the new Republican leaders where they're trying to hash out these differences. The problem for Kevin McCarthy is that of these 20 members, each has a unique concern that they are attempting to try and get Mac McCarthy to capitulate on. And the more he gives away, he then risks alienating those some 200 people that already support him. So he's finding himself in a very difficult position right now. And then, Ryan, talk to us. Is there a limit on the number of votes that they can keep having, number one? And number two, is there any chance whatsoever they move towards a plurality and explain that to our viewers and possibly elect Democrat Hakeem Jeffries? 
So the answer to your first question is no. This could go on indefinitely, and it will go on indefinitely until they come to a consensus and find someone that can be elected the next Speaker of the House. To your second question about the possibility of a plurality vote that would lead to a Democrat like Hakeem Jeffries becoming the next Speaker, it is possible, but it is very unlikely. That would require a, a, a deal that would be made between uh, some moderate Republicans, Kevin McCarthy and others, and members of the Democratic caucus. Uh, and that would mean McCarthy giving up even more leverage than he is uh, giving away to the conservatives, things like subpoena power and the number of people that serve on committees, perhaps even committee chairmanships. It would essentially give away all the power of the Republican majority that they work so hard to win in this midterm election. Uh, at this point, though, Tom, everything is on the table because we are at such a standstill. Anything is possible, but of the likely scenarios, the idea that we end up with a Democratic Speaker of the House is perhaps the least likely. Okay, Ryan Nobles, terrific reporting for us tonight. I know you have a lot of work ahead of you tonight into tomorrow. Thank you for that. The fight for the speakership revealing deep divisions within the Republican Party. Can McCarthy rally his members around him or will the GOP leave him behind? Here to help us analyze this chaotic situation on Capitol Hill, former National Republican Congressional Committee Communications Director. That's a mouthful, but a friend of Top Story, Matt Gorman. Matt, Matt joins us now. Matt, you're a Republican. Are you embarrassed by the GOP right now in the House? You know, we worked for two years to get to where we were yesterday, right? Taking back the majority. It's supposed to be a triumphant day. And it just dissolves into chaos. And we have this agenda that we plan to start pushing. And it's in hold. I, I mean, James Comer, who's going to be the oversight chair, was talking with Chuck Todd on this network a couple hours ago. And he says, I have all these subpoenas ready. We have these investigations ready. And until we sort this out and these 20 people back down, essentially, we can't do any of that. Do you understand what those 20 Republicans want? And, and is, are, are there factions of, of the GOP? I mean, obviously there is, but what, would, what, what percentage would you say of, of Republicans are those 20 holdouts representing right now? You know, I, I think broadly this has been a fight that has been in the making for a decade. And John Boehner and, and Paul Ryan, in a way, kind of papered over it. They tap danced around it. You know, Trump, I think, put it off because the power resided on the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue. And I keep going back, and in a way, the wheel just happened to stop on Kevin McCarthy here. I can't think of a, a single misstep or something he should have done differently. In a way, he was very well suited to handle this sort of scenario. He didn't dismiss, dismiss these folks like Boehner or Ryan really kind of did to an extent. He listened to them. He courted them. And I will say this. I think if it wasn't someone like Kevin or Kevin himself, I think this number, just by the factions you talk about, is probably close to 50 or 60, not 20. So I think this is a unique scenario, too. And it's unfortunate that McCarthy just ended up when the music stopped without a chair, so for people to speak. who are For people who like politics but are sort of casually watching this, can you explain how did McCarthy get into this position? Because McCarthy was always by Trump's side. I mean, he was always defending Trump. It, it, it's sort of odd that he finds him, himself in this position now. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I was kind of a little bit disheartened when I heard Garrett Hake's interview last night about how Trump was kind of seeming to back away from him. Overnight, he came out a little stronger. But look, McCarthy has been in or around leadership since close after he got elected, um, in around 06 or 08 or so, and he's been steadily building that. Obviously, in 2015, he got very close to running and essentially being nominated for speaker, then backing down. But the last several years, you know, he has been a very close ally of President Trump, even through the 2016 campaign, spoke at the 2016 convention when a a lot of folks in our party didn't and has been an ally i think the closest ally in leadership to him throughout you know the last five or six years yeah when you think about the relationship between senator mitch mcconnell and president trump former president trump and kevin mccarthy and president trump it's night and day it is. And look, I, I think what is differs McCarthy from McConnell, Boehner, Ryan, is McCarthy is very much a political animal. He loves this. When I was at the NRCC, he was the one who dived into the data on the districts, the polling, who is the best recruit for this district. He knew it all like the back of his hand. That is what he enjoys. That's what, he, that's what he's good at. And candidly, without him, there isn't a majority. There isn't the money we need to raise. There isn't the candidates we needed to recruit. So in a way, it, he's earned the right, in my opinion, to lead this majority that Matt, he created. We, 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 we got to go. But I do want to ask you, what do you think happens here? Does, does McCarthy get it or do they move on?
I think eventually we have the threshold lower because of Democrats, and McCarthy will get there. My okay, God. Matt Gorman, we'll see if he's right. Matt, we appreciate your time, as always. We turn now to the Florida Keys and a developing story there. Hundreds of migrants from Cuba and Haiti continue to be processed by officials after making the voyage in makeshift boats and fleeing economic and political turmoil. Food shortages and inflation as well, but officials say their agencies are stretched thin. Our Gabe Gutierrez is now with more and new reporting. Today, more dramatic video emerging from that cruise ship rescue. A group of migrants on a makeshift boat about 200 miles off the coast of Fort Lauderdale. The latest in what some authorities in Florida are calling a growing humanitarian crisis. The captain of the celebrity cruise documenting on social media how she and her crew rescued the group. That rescue comes as Dry Tortugas National Park, a group of seven islands 70 miles off the coast of Key West, is still closed to visitors as the U.S. evacuates Cuban migrants who came ashore there earlier in the week. Officials don't know when it'll reopen. In the last few days, authorities say more than 500 migrants have arrived along the Florida Keys. Customs and Border Protection reports a 400 percent increase of migrant encounters in the Miami sector since October 1st. Florida Senator Marco Rubio tweeting today the Florida Keys are now being overwhelmed with migrants arriving by boat. And so far, the Biden administration appears to have no plan to address this. Republicans have blasted the White House for what they see as lenient border policies that have contributed to a record number of unauthorized border crossings last year. Today, the president announcing that he intends to visit the U.S.-Mexico border for the first time since taking office. That's my intention. We're working out the details now. While in Dania Beach, Florida, our NBC station WTVJ saw more vans of migrants arriving at the Border Patrol station to be processed. In the parking lot, long-awaited family reunions. He came from Cuba. Leandro Garcia picking up his cousin, who he believes landed on a boat with 21 other migrants. Not too sorry, so, uh, he says it was it was very difficult. He says his cousin spent two nights at the Dana Beach station before being released to his family. I just feel such a, a sense of relief for him. And I'm, I'm so happy. You know, uh, I'm born here. And so I know how amazing this country is. And I've been several times to Cuba. I know it, it's it's very different. And I'm just so glad that, you know, he, he's able to leave there and and enjoy the, the freedoms and, and, and all the rights and privileges that we have in this country. All right, Gabe Gutierrez joins us now on set here on Top Story. So, Gabe, I do want to ask you, you mentioned that report, the president's trip to Mexico. I think it's next week. Is he going to visit the border? Well, that's a big question right now. The timing and the location are very fluid. It appears that the president might visit either before or after he attends the North American Leaders Summit in Mexico City. But again, the details are still being worked out. We spoke with officials in El Paso, and they tell me that they have not yet been made aware of any plans for a president. Visit time. There's obviously a lot of pressure on the Biden administration because of the border, the record numbers, which you've been reporting on all of last year. And now we're seeing what's happening in Florida and the Florida Keys. I, I do have to ask you, I know there's been some, some reporting and, and some information out there about some migrants able to be processed and others not. What do we know about that situation? Well, we saw in that story that obviously some Cubans and potentially many Cubans yeah. are being allowed to stay. And it is difficult when it comes to repatriating Cubans. As you know, Tom, the you know, U.S. does not have formal diplomatic. Yeah relations with Cuba. And so a lot of immigration attorneys say there are still a lot of outstanding questions about which can be repatriated, which cannot. Many are being allowed to stay and are being able to give, get driver's licenses, but not being allowed to apply for formal citizenship. New developments tonight on that suspect accused of killing four University of Idaho students. Newly released body cam footage shows the moment Indiana State Police pulled over Brian Koberger for a traffic violation about a month after those murders. And take a look. He's in the driver's seat of a white Hyundai Elantra, the one that sources have told NBC News they, they've taken from his house, which investigators in Idaho, of course, announced they were looking for just a week before. Koberger was extradited back to Moscow, Idaho, from Pennsylvania today. And that's where NBC's Gotti Schwartz joins us live tonight. Gotti, we'll get to that body cam video in just a moment. But first, I do want to ask you, what happens to Koberger once he arrives there in Idaho? And what is the scene like right now and, 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 and the sentiment there with all those people who have been waiting for this alleged killer to come back? Yeah, it's a big question of timing right now, Tom. We know that the plane is somewhere over possibly Wyoming or Montana. It's still making its way uh, over to Idaho. It's been a very long day. That plane has been in the air since early this morning, uh, touching down a couple of times. The one that we believe to be transporting uh, Brian Kohlberger. 
But right now, it looks like if he does land in the next two hours or so, it's going to be too late to bring him to court here. The judge is getting ready uh, to leave, so it's likely that we're not going to be able to see uh, those charging documents. The question is, is he going to be able to see those charging documents? Uh, we understand because of Idaho law, as soon as he comes back to Idaho, uh, that's when he will see those charging documents, uh, the, the probable cause statement that will uh, contain some of the evidence, some of the case that the state has uh, brought forth against him uh, to make those arrests. Now, at this point, he has not seen those. The public has not seen those. Law enforcement sources have told us that they, uh, they believe DNA is involved and specifically genetic uh, genealogy was used in this case. But we won't see those until they are unsealed at the court. And law enforcement at this point here in Moscow isn't answering any more questions because there's been a gag order uh, put out by the, the judge here saying that uh, law enforcement and investigators are not to speak about anything that is, contain that is not contained in those sealed documents. And those documents are still under seal. Tom. And, and the family members of those victims also wanting to know what the evidence was here and how they, they got to this guy. I, I do want to get back to that newly released video. I, I, I sort of find this fascinating. I'm sure a lot of people do as well. Koberger's in the driver's seat of that white Hyundai Elantra just days after police said they were looking for one. Here's a map of the trip. He's pulled over in Indiana, pretty far from Idaho. And I think one of the reasons, if we can play that video again, I think a lot of people are going to be thinking, if this guy indeed did hit what was going through his head as he got pulled over? Was he incredibly nervous? Uh, was, was he trying to act calm? These are things well, I'm sure we'll, we'll learn later, but, but do we know why police stopped him? Yeah, so there were actually there were two stops, and that's the weird thing, especially when you see both of these back to back, because they happened pretty close to each other and pretty close in time. So the one that you're seeing there, that's the first stop, and this is the first time that we actually see his full uh, full upper torso. You see his hands, uh, you see his head, you see his facial expressions. Hard to read into what he was thinking. Uh, his dad does most of the talking, and his dad is closest to the body cam that was being worn by the deputy, and so you can see hear a little bit of the conversation. A lot of it is muffled, uh, but Tom, just walking you through that conversation, the officer basically pulls up, uh, gets Brian's driver's license, asks him some questions, and then Brian and the father start telling him that they're coming from uh, from the university, and they're, they're saying that there was something uh, of a SWAT situation that happened uh, at the university. The officer is a little bit confused. The university is maybe like a thousand miles away, so he says he hadn't heard of it, and then the officer asks if Brian was works at the university. Uh, Brian says he does work at WSU, and his father says something about him being a PhD in criminology. And then shortly after that, the officer lets them go. And shortly after that, they get pulled over again, again for following too closely. But at this point, uh, we don't know why the officers let them go. We don't know if the officers had heard that bolo to be on the lookout for a white Hyundai Alacha. Still a lot of questions unanswered. All right, we are back now with Top Stories News Feed, and we begin with the manhunt in Baltimore after a deadly shooting near a high school. Police say five teenagers were shot in a shopping center across from the school. A 16-year-old later died from his injuries. Four others remain hospitalized. Police now looking for at least two of those gunmen. Also, we have the latest on two pipe bombs left near the Capitol ahead of January 6, 2021. You may remember this. The FBI is now offering half a million dollars for information leading to an arrest. Tomorrow marks two years since the explosives were left outside the Democratic and Republican National Committee headquarters. They were found as the riot unfolded the next day. And the so-called mastermind behind the college admissions cheating scandal has been sentenced to three and a half years in prison. 62-year-old Rick Singer pleaded guilty in 2019 to orchestrating the bribery scheme, which had rich and famous parents bind their kids' way into the nation's top universities. More than 52 people, including actresses Lori Loughlin and Felicity Hoffman, were charged in that scandal. Next tonight, the ongoing battle surrounding reproductive rights. The FDA announcing for the first time Retail pharmacies that include corner drug stores and major chains like CVS and Walgreens will be allowed to offer abortion pills. 
This comes as some states move to further restrict abortion. I want to bring in NBC's Ann Thompson and explain to our viewers how big of an announcement this is, because this is a game changer. It is. And the whole goal here, Tom, is to improve access to the abortion, these abortion pills, which are the most common form of abortion in this country. It's called medication abortion. So basically, before the pandemic, you had to go in person to a doctor's office or a clinic to get the pills. The pandemic changed that. Women were then able to use telemedicine to do it. Now you can use telemedicine and then go to, with a prescription, to your local pharmacy to get the pills if they are certified to get the pills. The other thing that could happen, you could order them through the mail through an online pharmacy, again, if it undergoes this certification for the pills. But to be clear, because so many people, as we were talking about earlier, will be fighting on both sides mm -hmm. over this, you do need some type of prescription. You do, you absolutely, it, it is. You have to consult a healthcare professional. You can do that by telehealth. And so that makes it easier for women. Finally, a lot of the, the stories we've been doing, the reporting we've been doing after what happened with Roe versus mm -hmm. Wade, and it being overturned, of course, by the Supreme Court had to do with conservative states limiting uh, reproductive rights. What's going to happen with those conservative states and this? That's the big X factor. There are 18 states that outlaw telehealth medication abortions. Um, but the today, the or excuse me, this week, the Justice Department ruled that the Postal Service can deliver these pills without any risk to, the, to them because they say the Postal Service doesn't know what the intent or where these pills will be used. So you can expect to see in coming weeks this will be yet another issue, I'm sure, that will end up in court. Okay, and thank you for that. We want to turn out of money talks, what consumers and investors need to know from the business world and beyond. Tonight, mortgage demand dropping. The volume of applications down more than 13% at the end of last week from just two weeks earlier. This coming as mortgage interest rates shot up throughout 2022 and again right at the end of the year. I want to bring in CNBC's real estate correspondent, Diana Olick. Diana, I want to bring that chart back up one more time so our viewers can see that a little bit more closely. We see this huge surge in mortgage rates, and then we start to see it sort of trickle down the amount of people getting those 30-year fixed mortgage rates. I do want to be fair here. Last week, obviously, was sort of a holiday week. Does that matter, or is this a, a sign of things to come? I'm sorry to say it doesn't matter at all. These numbers are seasonally adjusted. And if you look at the year-over-year -year numbers, which would be the same timing, it's even worse. Mortgage rates started last year at 3.5%. They are now at 6.5%. So you're talking double. And for a person buying a home right now, that's going to translate into more than 60% higher monthly mortgage payment than just one year ago. So unfortunately, it's not the season. It's the economy. Well, talk to me about what's going to happen here, because it almost feels like the real estate market is going to become frozen in a sense. And by that, I mean, if the mortgage rates are too high, people, it's going to be too expensive. They're going to be priced out. But Diana, we've been spending more than a year talking about how, how many areas around the country, there wasn't a whole lot of homes to begin with. Uh, the, the, the demand was high, but the supply was still low. I know that's changing, but what do we expect in, in the months to come? Well, you're right to say it's a bit frozen right now because people are really waiting to see what happens in the market. I mean, you are seeing more supply, and that's a really good thing. The problem is it's not a lot of new supply. It's older supply that's been sitting on the market longer. In fact, 15% longer to sell a home today than it did one year ago. But you are seeing inventory up over 40%. Now, if we get into that all-important spring market, which, by the way, actually unofficially begins President's Day weekend, so not too far from now, we could see some new listings come on the market and bring more buyers back in. There is definitely demand out there. It's just a question of where will prices be and where will rates be? And will potential buyers get used to these higher rates and start to say, OK, prices are coming back a little. Maybe I should step back in. Did you say that stat uh, over 40 percent, that's supply, there's more homes coming online? Is that what you were, what you were saying? Is that is that pre-pandemic or from the pandemic sort of era? From one year ago, okay. supply is up for over 40% from one year ago. Pre-pandemic, though, we're still about 3% lower than we were in 2019. So we're not really where we need to be yet with supply, but we're much better placed than we were a year ago. Yeah, still still a tough market. Finally, I know you're, you're on the phone all day. What, what are your sources telling you? What are the experts thinking? Anybody in real estate is sort of always bullish, but are you still hearing that going into next year? 
No, I'm not hearing a lot of bullishness, except for those who are saying, okay, it's a less competitive market, so it's probably a bit easier for buyers trying to get in. The big question now is prices. We've seen prices pull back 2.5% just from June, and the annual gains are now half what they were in June. We're still up about 8.5% from a year ago, but prices are really pulling back, and in some markets, they're pulling more sharply than others. So it really is going to depend on where, what the prices are, and when buyers say, okay, I feel like prices have pulled back, and when sellers say, okay, I feel like I could step into this market and still do a pretty good job at it, that's when the market's going to come back. Right now, everyone's kind of waiting and seeing. Diana, real quick, uh, before you go, any red flag markets, and by that I mean any markets where people are saying the real estate market in that area, prices are going to come down dramatically or there's a bubble there. Are you hearing about any cities like that? Yeah, we are seeing that the cities that were the hottest markets in the pandemic, I'm talking Phoenix, Las Vegas, and a lot of the Sunbelt areas, prices are starting to come back pretty sharply there. But you're still seeing, strangely, Miami with much higher prices than everyone else in the rest of the country. So there's still demand. People still want to move to the Sunbelt. And those prices are not coming back quite yet. But in other parts, as I said, in the West, they are coming back more sharply. CNBC's Diana Oleg for us. Diana, thank you. Now to Top Stories Global Watch, starting with Russia, now blaming cell phones for that deadly Ukrainian strike on one of its units. The Russian Defense Ministry saying soldiers who used their phones without permission allowed Ukraine to locate their targets. The New Year's Eve attack killing dozens of Russian soldiers in Donetsk. The World Health Organization issuing a warning about China's handling of its recent COVID surge. The UN Health Agency says China is underrepresenting both hospitalizations and deaths from the virus. Officials say China has reported five or fewer deaths a day since reversing its zero COVID policy. However, as we've reported, staff and hospitals at funeral homes across China say they are overwhelmed. And record high temperatures leaving ski slopes across Europe with almost no snow. New satellite images showing the dramatic change at ski resorts in Switzerland, Austria, and France compared to this time last year. Some left almost completely bare. One slope in Croatia even forced to use artificial snow for a skiing event they had there. Okay, coming up, the rail project warning. A new rail line being built in Mexico touted by officials as a way to connect remote and indigenous lands. Why experts now say it's actually destroying some of the country's ancient history. Stay with us. Welcome back. An alert has been issued for a 27-year-old man in Colorado, the first for the state's new Missing Indigenous Person Alert Program. A few other states, including Colorado and Washington, issuing their own programs as thousands of missing and murder cases involving indigenous people remain unsolved. Valerie Castro tonight with this story. A first-of-its-kind alert issued in Colorado as a family desperately searches for a missing loved one. We've been calling jails hospitals, psych wards. I mean, we've been just doing whatever we can. And 27-year-old Wombly V. Hill is the first face on a missing indigenous person alert in the state just days after the program was enacted. The Colorado Bureau of Investigations issuing the alert Tuesday after V. Hill left a relative's home in Denver and never returned. All we need to know is whether he's safe or not. The 2022 legislation to create such alerts backed by the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Relatives Task Force in the state. My hope is that the alert is never used, but we did develop the this alert knowing that unfortunately it would probably have to be used. Nationwide, the Bureau of Indian Affairs estimates there are approximately 4,200 missing and murdered cases involving indigenous people or MMIPs that have gone unsolved. Most are women. Statistically, native people um, suffer rates of violence that are disproportionate to any other demographic in the United States. Advocacy groups believe systemic discrimination and racism can play a role in the attention these cases receive. And this is what we're missing across the MMIP cases nationwide. There is no sense of urgency, whether it's from local media, whether it's from law enforcement, whether it's any other uh, realm of leadership, there's no reaction. Anybody who works in law enforcement will tell you that the time is of an essence when someone is missing, whether it's a child, whether it's a, an adult. But now a few states, including Colorado and Washington, have enacted specific alerts in an effort to raise awareness. California implementing what it calls the Feather Alert Program as of the first of this year, though no alerts have been issued yet. The Washington State Patrol issuing 32 alerts since that state's program was enacted in July. So that alone to me is a success because we're able to get out 
and educate and raise awareness to the issue and the, and the problem and the reporting uh, stumbling blocks that families encounter. All but six of those missing have been accounted for. In Colorado, Vigil's family hoping someone recognizes his face. He knows we're here for him. He's got a, a network of people that love him and would do anything to help him. All right, Valerie Castro joins us now in studio. So, Valerie, we saw there in your report, California, Washington, Colorado, they all have programs. Any other states looking to set up these types of alerts? Well, New Mexico is actually trying something completely different. That state says the Indian Affairs Department has partnered with the FBI to create an ongoing monthly list of missing indigenous people in New Mexico and across the Navajo Nation that extends across state lines. But a spokesperson says right now there are no imminent plans to enact any legislation to create alerts as in those other states. Okay, Valerie, thank you for that. We turn now to the Americas, where we're following multiple stories tonight, starting with major protests out of Bolivia. Hundreds of truckers blocked highways and roads across Bolivia's farming region, following the arrest of the local governor. Protests gripping the region for a week, threatening vital deliveries of grain and food around that country. And in Mexico, scientists and environmentalists are sounding the alarm on a controversial rail line being built in the jungle. The project known as the Mayan train is carving through previously untouched wilderness in southern Mexico. We've reported on this before here on Top Story. Experts say it's endangering wildlife and destroying ancient cave systems. President Andres López Obrador says the railway will bring connectivity to remote and poor areas of the region. And the U.S. Embassy in Cuba will resume visa processing for the first time since 2017. Priority will be placed on permits to reunite Cubans who have family in the U.S. Visa and consular services stopped nearly six years ago after multiple diplomats became sick with a mysterious illness now known as the Havana Syndrome. It comes as a record number of Cubans are fleeing that country. All right, coming up, some wild video and a real-life travel nightmare for some. We'll show you this crazy video, the feline that tried to upgrade to first class and the flight attendant just trying to find the owner at 30,000 feet. Stay with us. Finally tonight, a new kind of unruly passenger. The seatbelt sign was on, but one four-legged traveler didn't get the memo, strutting all the way up to first class during a cross-country flight, hoping for an upgrade. Savannah Sellers explains. On a cross-country United flight from Dallas to San Francisco before the new year, this catastrophic announcement. You lost your cat? Um, uh, cat? That toad is running around the airplane. And I need you to come explain that. A feisty feline, tired of traveling under the seat in economy, clawing their way all the way up to first class. That's where a flight attendant grabbed the tabby momentarily. Watch out, guys. This tabby's attempt at a first class upgrade wasn't persuasive. The owner coming up and claiming his cat. But this wasn't the first time. Video circulating on social media this year showed another cat loose on a flight, even climbing on the top of seats. And in 2015, one flight attendant's reaction going viral after another feline got out of its carrier and took over the aisle. Okay, whoever's cat this is, please come and wake them up. If you see them with the cat carrier, I need them to come and get their pet. Many airlines now only allow service dogs on flights after passengers tried to bring a string of exotic animals on planes, including this peacock in 2018. But United welcomes all cats and dogs as long as they fit comfortably in a carrier and, of course, stay in it. Savannah Sellers, NBC News. All right, we thank Savannah for that report, and we thank you for watching Top Story as always. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.